Hello, everybody, as everyone starts joining us. This is the uh, Health and Safety on the Shop Floor webinar with Cooperatives UK. As you know, this is part of our Co-ops Connections um, series of events, which we're now conducting online. We're pleased to have you all with us. And um, just so you're aware, there's various sectors that are joining us today. Mostly we're going to be talking about retail, but we, we do have a variety of sectors, including from um, universities, food, pubs, sports. So thank you all. We hope something is going to be of relevance to all of you. And um, we're pleased to have our panel with us, which Gary from Co-ops UK is going to introduce in a moment. Um, we will be having about 25 minutes of discussion with the expert panelists from Central, Southern um, and Eastern um, Regional Cooperatives. So Gary will introduce those. And then following that, we'll have some time for your questions and answers. So please, as you're um, listening to the, um, to the panelists, then please do put in all of your questions as well. And we'll come to those. Um, during the um, conversation, but at the end of um, Gary's discussion with the panelists, we'll then allow your, your questions to be kind of voiced. Um, you can also, if you want to, don't be shy, put up your hands and we can unmute you and, uh, and wait for that. And you can also speak to the panelists if you would wish to, that's no problem at all. We would like it to be as informal as possible, obviously, um, and for you to have a, a chance to ask your questions um, online. Um, we have the Q&A function, so that is the best place to put your questions. If others would like to know um, to have those questions answered, then um, there's a thumbs up. So click that thumbs up and that kind of bumps all the questions to the top. That's really helpful to us as well. So do make sure that if you want a question specifically answered, then that, click that thumbs up as well. And um, we will also end with a little bit of a discussion after your questions. Um, with how we're coming out of COVID, what it might look like going back out of lockdown and to your premises, and the panelists will have a bit of a discussion with that as well. Again, if you wanted to participate, put your hand up and I'll unmute you. So um, we do have a poll. Um, Gareth, would you be able to just click that poll? And we just want to get a little idea from um, the attendees. We've got about 13 of you so far. There may be more joining us. Um, please click whether health and safety is your primary role. Just click one, please. A secondary role or other, if it's not your role, perhaps you're interested, you can let us know in the chat, things like that. Just in the chat, use that for standalone um, comments, Q&A for your questions that you want to specifically um, get answered. So we can see the majority of you in other roles. <laughs> There's a, a few of you in your primary role and a secondary role, so that's kind of split. Um, but most of you at the moment are interested, so we can understand that you may be having to take this information back to your organisations and start implementing these um, within your organisations. Or maybe there's, there's reasons that you don't have a dedicated health and safety officer in, in your organisations, which is, um, again, um, pertinent. So we also have a second poll as well, Gareth. Would you be able to click the second poll? Oh, yep. Yeah. So that's 27% of you, your primary role, 18% secondary role, most of you at 55%. And um, this is another role for you. And then the second poll, how many workers in your organization? Again, click the one that's relevant to you. So that's useful for us to know as well. Okay, fairly good mix there. If you haven't clicked already, please do. We'll just have a little bit more time if we can. Okay. So again, that's split fairly evenly. Um, but 30% of you have 500 plus in your organizations. Again, really interesting to know. So we will share some of this information with you at the end of the webinar as well. Um, and any of the um, information that we're coming out with today, the recording of this webinar will also be found on our website. Um, and that's, that we will be able to share with you in our chat links as well. 
Um, the question and answers will be recorded as well. Any that aren't answered today, we will try and get those answered at some point and then send those to you following the webinar. And, um, and without further ado, I think we're probably ready to um, rock and roll. So we'll welcome Gary from Cooperatives UK. He's our senior lawyer at Co-ops UK and he'll introduce the panel to you and we'll carry on um, with the panelists again for about 25 minutes and then there'll be time for your questions afterwards. So please do fill in the Q&A section and, uh, and then we'll come to those um, in a while. Thank you very much. Okay, Gary, over to you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, which will address um, health and safety matters arising from the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. As Irene said, I'm Gary Morrison. I'm a senior solicitor with Corps UK. My speciality is employment, not health and safety. Um, just by way of background, the webinar has arisen as a result of the health and safety forums, which are facilitated by Corps UK. Um, those health and safety forums usually take place on a quarterly basis um, and are used as a way of sharing knowledge and best practice in terms of health and safety um, and are organised for the benefit of all Corps UK members um, and they're free to attend should you wish to do so as a Corps UK member. T today what we've got is three um, very experienced health and safety practitioners with us who attend those health and safety forums whilst they're employed by three of the larger retail societies in, um, in the spirit of cooperation, they've kindly agreed to give up the time to share their experience with you and address any health and safety matters you may have arising from the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I'll just introduce you to those. First of all, we have Tom Watmore. Tom, Tom's a risk manager at Southern Cooperative. Um, Southern Cooperative, remember, they have approximately 4,000 colleagues across 300 sites um, in the south of England, I think made up of funeral, food, retail uh, and a number of franchise operations. Tom's got over 10 years experience in health and safety uh, and environmental uh, and before moving to the retail sector with Southern, Tom has previously worked in both uh, the utilities and aviation sector. We also have Neil Renault. Neil is head, and safe, head of health and safety at East of England Cooperative, based over there in Ipswich. Neil's a chartered member of the Institute of Occupational Health and Safety. Um, Neil's got some 19 years of experience in health and safety, predominantly, I think, in the retail sector. Um, he's worked for East of England for, I think, the last seven years, having previously worked for the cooperative group, um, again, in the cooperative sector. Um, finally, we've got Roger Mitchell. Roger's compliance manager at Central England Cooperative. Roger's worked for Central England for, I think, three and a half years. And in his role, he deals with health, safety, health and safety, sorry, food safety and some trading standards issues. Uh, prior to joining Central England, Roger has experience both in the public sector, having been an environmental health officer for Derby City Council, and in the private sector as global health and safety manager for Games Workshop, and also as European health and safety manager for Gold Debt Associates. Um, a global environmental services consultancy. So got a real broad um, spread of experience there and quite a depth of experience as well. What I propose to do is for me to put a number of questions to our panelists, which are typical and illustrate um, the types of queries they've been dealing with to date as a result of the pandemic and the lockdown. Um, so I'll put those to the panelists um, probably take about 20-25 minutes after which we can have a question and answer session probably of half an hour. Um, what I do need to say is, is that the information and knowledge shared today is by way of guidance only. Uh, it shouldn't be relied on a specific ad advice dealing with specific instances. You may need to take your own professional advice if you're looking at specific particular circumstances. So what I'd like to do is move on and ask some of those questions of the panellists, um, looking at some of the key challenges they've had over the past 12 weeks or so. Um, I think probably the first question I'll put to Tom, if that's all right. Tom, can you tell us how you've managed and reacted to um, changing government guidelines and advice um, in respect to what's happened in the last 12 weeks? in terms of things like business continuity and, and dealing with any changes? Yeah, well, other than um, putting my hair out somewhat, um, 
the best we can really, Gary. So I think as an organization of our size, um, and I'm bound to say this in my role, but um, we've got a relatively mature business continuity and crisis management approach. Um, and that works quite well in the short term, these sort of established systems. Um, but given the situation, it soon became apparent that um, we'd have to adapt that model. Um, it was based on a kind of singular event. So we were always looking at things like loss of head office or IT failure, um, but we had to adapt it to take into account, you know, this ever-changing landscape and, and the impact of COVID on, on every single aspect of our operation. Um, and also to get used to acting with pace for a prolonged period of time as well. Um, so practically, I think for us, what that means is we're trying to keep on top of it by watching the daily press conferences, um, speaking to other retailers, like those on the call, um, industry bodies, yourselves at Co-ops UK, as well as um, for us, the ACS, the Association of Convenience Stores. Um, the ACS, for example, have got a seat at the table with government. They lobby on policy positions and, and they have a two-way sort of communication, which is useful. So they can take some of our feedback um, back up to government as well. Um, on the ground for us, we, we've essentially merged our leadership team and our operational teams, um, try to strip away some of those layers of, of kind of red tape so that we could have discussions about a topic. We could reach a decision based on that discussion. We could obviously uh, obtain approval on that decision and, and we could just implement it. So we could kind of work in, in, in minutes or hours rather than days, weeks or months as we would normally going through the normal sort of process. The ever-changing goalposts, um, I think if you told me six months ago that we'd be doing some of the things we're doing now, I'd have, I'd have laughed at you. Um, but we've had to be flexible. We've had to accept that things are moving at pace and we need to move with them um, and be prepared to change our position on things as well, um, whether it's face coverings or sanitizer for, for, for customers, what have you. Um, in the early days, I know we talked a lot about things we need to do to keep colleagues and customers safe and then things we need to be seen to do to make them feel safe. Um, and we try to treat each of those with equal importance whilst not deviating too far from the government guidelines. Um, we always felt that those government guidelines were and are our sort of lifeline. Um, there's lots of other information out there which you can quickly and very easily get bogged down in. Um, but for us, uh, we're finding sticking to the guidelines as best we can. We have something to fall back on um, and sort of steer us through these, these treacherous waters um, of what's understandably a, a sort of emotive and also subjective topic. Um, it was a lot harder in the early days, um, but now that we've got our sp specific working safety guidance produced by the government um, with explicit recommendations, it's become a lot easier. Uh, I know we'll talk about that document again a bit later, I'm sure, um, but, but that's been a real useful um, sort of signpost for us. And I guess my, my tip is if you've not already got that as a retailer, then you need to familiarise yourself with that document and also register for the updates. Um, it was released on the 11th of May and it's already been updated twice. Um, that's, that's sort of it for me, Ray. Yeah, well, I mean, I, 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 can, I can tell you that certainly from an employment perspective, it, it does change quite quickly. I think the, uh, the job retention scheme, the last count was on version four. So, yeah, I understand what you're saying, Tom. Um, Neil, uh, uh, Roger, have you got anything to add to that in respect to how you've managed and changed or reacted to um, government guidelines and changes? So, so from a, a central England point of view, it, it sort of mirrors uh, what happened at Southern with, with, uh, with Tom. So uh, the initial thing we did was uh, review our business continuity plans. Uh, and to be honest, that wasn't, they weren't up to date. So, so that was one of the first tasks to actually get the various sectors to, to update the connections and the actual plans and make it fit for purpose for, for, for a virus uh, uh, that we were facing. Uh, and what we tended to do was, uh, similar to Tom, we, we sort of improved communications, we worked at pace, uh, there was, I had regular catch-ups within my team on a sort of three times a week, uh, I had uh, connections with, with retail regularly sort of twice a week, and, and that seemed to be needed just to be able to react to things and sort of gain, gain support and gain discussion on things as they were changing. Uh, the other one, one other thing was that we were working closely with, uh, especially yes, retail, but also procurement. Uh, procurement, we've got a procurement team, and they were uh, inundated with the requests for PPE uh, for different types of masks and gloves and sanitizer. So we supported them in terms of the the criteria that were needed and that was relevant. 
uh, uh, and that sort of seemed to to help help things. Uh, and again, we've sort of updated things as and when they've changed. Um, and the the guide that Tom referred to was did seem to sort of set a line in the sand and make it much clearer. Um, uh, I'm not sure if it's our our mentality, but uh, that was really useful, and that's what we're referring to, you know, referring to today. So yeah, that's it from Central. Neil. Yeah, and from my point of view, just sort of leading on from Tom's point, really, I think the biggest challenge in the early days was not necessarily dealing with the government guidelines. It was dealing with public perception and staying aligned with the government guidelines. Um, so we were similar to Southern Corp. We had to make our stance in the early days to say, right, government guidelines is, our, is where our focus is and, and we're going to stick to this because there's a lot of worried, scared people out there in those early days in particular who... Um, we're demanding that face masks be issued across the board. They're worn by everyone, for example. And it was very easy to get carried away and um, run at a pace that we we really didn't and shouldn't be running at that stage. Um, so I think the, and the government were learning as well. Like I said, the, the workplace guide now, if we'd have had that however many months it was uh, now, right at the start of the, the process, uh, I think it would have been a much more manageable situation. But everyone was, everyone was uh, like I said, learning at pace. Um, but we, we, we're maintaining the stance now. The government guideline is the, is the key port. But we also recognise there is this element where we may have to sway from that slightly just for the um, just to show that we are supporting our colleagues where we where we need to. Thank you. I mean, in, in terms of practicalities, I think um, I think one of the questions or one of the typical questions you said you, you, you faced was um, what you needed to do in terms of social distancing, meeting those guidelines and achieving social social distancing in, in retail convenience stores. And I wonder if you could share some of the, the things you've put into place, some of the things you've done, some of the steps you've taken, in, in certainly in your experience, in, in the retail environments and convenience stores. Um, Rod, Jeremy, could you start us off with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Uh... This is one of the, the things that make one of the main things that evolved over time. Sort of initially, uh, we did react quickly. It was our marketing team that generated uh, quick POS uh, and imaging and signage that could be printed off locally in store, so that things were, were put in place relatively quickly. Uh, they weren't, you know, they they were just they were quick and and uh, they reached a suitable uh, solution. Then they were re revamped uh, with corporate branding. Uh, and at this stage, we included uh, till screens, uh, but the till screens were sort of the flimsy plastic because I, I think we weren't sure how long it would last. Uh, so initially they were flimsy plastic and then we, we moved over to the Perspex, it's more of a permanent, uh, permanent solution. But uh, uh, we included floor markings, door marshals, customer, sort of managing customer numbers, uh, a one-way customer flow. So these were sort of summarized in, in this content. And then we developed a back of house guide, so to support uh, colleagues. So we, we transferred floor markings in the warehouse and corridors, uh, designated a, a maximum number of colleagues per office for the canteen, uh, toilets, uh, you know, et cetera. Um, and then we're ha updating it with a front of house guide. So it's evolving. It's one of those, one of those many things that are evolving as and when uh, the guidance and, and uh, the situation is changing. Um, but uh, we're, yeah, so 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 that, that's what we're doing in, in terms of uh, social distancing. Neil, Tom, have you got anything to add on, on the practical steps you've taken in terms of social distancing, both for, both for customers and staff, I suppose, in retail stores? Um, yeah, so, yeah, I can go. So, so all the good things that, that we're just doing, um, some other points to talk to, we're currently trialing a sort of traffic light system at the entrance to our stores. Um, so this is a self-contained unit um, that monitors people coming in and out. Um, and then it will using um, audio and visual alarms, it will, will try and manage your queue for you. Um, that's not only to save us the, the, the cost, to be blunt, of having a colleague stand at the front of the store, but it's also to get somebody away from the customers queuing out the front to remove them from that area of risk as well. Um, so, so we're trialing that as a practical measure. Um, a simple example of that we've spoken about previously was whether you would have um, you know, posters up at the front of your store advertising your quieter times. So if there is a queue, you're telling customers up front, you know, come back at 
at this time it may be a bit quieter and you're trying to just um, flatten out your customer flow throughout the day. Um, staff working practice wise, um, I mean we close, originally we were closing stores to work stock just to protect colleagues. Um, we've got a bit smarter, a bit cleverer with this now. So we're working stock kind of back of house, getting it to a point at which we're ready to get it onto the shop floor and closing aisles. Um, and whilst putting it on the shop floor, but also acknowledging the fact that customers will still expect to be able to get hold of the tin of beans that's in that blocked off aisle. So coming up with a process that we can still manage social distancing, customer service, whilst protecting colleagues that are doing that. Um, we're looking at relatively cheap kind of t-shirts. So this is around the nudge theory. So constantly trying to remind colleagues and also customers about the importance of social distancing. So if we can have it plastered over our chests or on our backs, um, it, Probably won't be the golden bullet but it might just help nudge people along the right way at a relatively low cost um, things like promoting contactless payments um, we're asking members to scan their own membership cards as well so we don't have to you know so we can reduce our contact points and also practically we've um, we cut right down on the number of third parties that we wanted to come to our sites um, and we're now starting to ramp that up a little bit so who is essential that should come to our sites um, who's less essential? What should we do with field-based colleagues? Um, and, and we're still working our way through trying to get some of those people back in now, but without um, having unnecessary contact in store. Yeah, leading on from that, I mean, I won't go over the uh, the points the guys have uh, just been through there. We, we are all reasonably aligned in, 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 in the actions we take from a social distancing point of view. Um, I think the key thing for me is we're, we, we've got a mix of supermarkets and convenience stores, so not one size fits all so the government guidelines are quite prescriptive in terms of the things you should look at and like that but there's some areas that we we can't apply across the board in all our stores like a typical example is the suggestion of one-way systems in stores for our larger stores it works quite well um, big wide aisles or a square box defined defined aisles where it's in our convenience sector it's it's not as simple as that and a one-way system would actually hinder social distancing more with pinch points etc so i think the key thing for me is not thinking that one size fits all and also because the government lines government guidelines state that some action is advised it doesn't mean you have to do it you just need to justify why you have done it or you haven't done it um, and what alternatives you might have put in place can, can i just touch on something that occurred to me in terms of staff working practices have, have we changed any any practices significantly um breaks or restroom facilities um what uh, what about washing sanitizing hands what steps have you taken in terms of um, managing staff practices yeah go ahead john i'm um, so i was gonna say so i mean as a convenience stores i don't think any of us will run with too many colleagues none of us would say we've got capacity to reduce the amount of colleagues in store we're already running quite light on that you often tend to have relatively fixed teams of people um, you do obviously have people fit, you know, fitting gaps and things um, around hygiene we, I think we've all um, you know provided sanitizer for colleague use and we'll be looking to do it for customers if we're not already doing it um, in some stores I'm sure um, increasing the amount of time that colleagues are able to so empowering colleagues if they need to get off the shop floor for a while and go back of house to, to wash their hands telling them that's okay you don't have to be working non-stop and, and, and just up in cleaning routines so We've got you know, very set, clear cleaning routines that we do normally. They all remain the same. And then over and above that, we've got our COVID clean that's being done multiple times throughout the day. And that's the obvious stuff. It's all the hand contact points and everything. Okay. I mean, in terms, just, just sort of staying in the area of staff, I mean, what have you... Have any of you taken as a policy, and I know some of this actually is HR stuff, but from a health and safety perspective, um, have you taken any particular steps in identifying and protecting any vulnerable staff within your organisation who are continuing to, I don't mean furloughing or, or shielding, but people who are maybe vulnerable who continue to work, have you, have you taken any steps um, to, to protect them? At all? Um, yeah. And I'll go if you like. Um, yeah, so from it's probably the the biggest and earliest piece of work we we did in the whole process in terms of the protecting the vulnerable and extremely vulnerable colleagues. Um, we um, the 
the government obviously launched the guidelines that vulnerable colleagues um, should be adhering to strict social distancing measures. And then you've got the extremely vulnerable, obviously, um, adhering with shielding. Um, so we, we um, obviously had to get our heads around this with the HR department and what the extremely vulnerable are quite, is it the easier ones to deal with, if you like, because it was quite clear that they shouldn't be at work, they should be at home. And we had a good idea of who those colleagues were. Um, but then we had this group of people who fell in this vulnerable category. So you had the pregnant employees, you had the 70s and overs, and you had those with the what called the, the lesser underlying health conditions, asthma, COPD, etc. Um, that we didn't really know which co where the colleagues were, who they were. Um, so we, we opened up a helpline to, to attract these people to us, to make contact. Um, so we could identify these people and obviously discuss with them um, the situation, um, how we could adhere to social distancing with them remaining at work. Um, so, for example, we've got a funeral division um, and we were allowed them to work behind closed doors where the contact was minimal to none with other people. So we were satisfied we could do it in them circumstances. Um, with our food stores, it was a lot more difficult because it was in the early stages where our social distancing measures weren't what they are now. Um, and so we, we had to make some decisions around, well, could we actually allow these people to work, bearing in mind that, um, like I said, we can't guarantee that strict social distancing could be adhered to. Um, so we did have a, a, a proportion of colleagues who, who, who we didn't, vulnerable colleagues who we didn't um, have back to work for a period. Uh, and we and she um, set that period 12 weeks. Um, so that was probably the the biggest piece of work in terms of how we were going to support them while they're absent, um, in terms of pay, um, emotional support and that side of things. Um, we also incorporated our occupational health um, partners as well. So we, we um, had a conversation with them and we set up some arrangement where we had um, phone consults. Um, so the guys, um, so those that we weren't prepared and equipped to make decisions on whether they should, shouldn't be work, we utilised our occupational health. And they offered us some great advice on, on steps we could take to allow them to work, but maintain social distancing, or in some cases, they said, well, they, they shouldn't be at work. Um, so, yeah, so it's a bit of a blended approach. But the, of course, the challenge now is um, we've got those people who have now been off for 12 weeks. How do we safely get them back into the business? So it's something we're working very closely with our, with our HR department at the moment. Tom, Roger, anything? I'd, I'd, uh, go ahead, Roger. Uh, well, just from from our point of view, sort of a lot of this was dealt with by HR, and uh, uh, they sort of were, were, they led it, so I didn't really get involved um, um, in detail. But one thing just to add is the the updating, as as Neil said, in terms of uh, the return to work process. So we're actually uh, working with HR to re to review the, the the form and the process to include COVID the COVID groups. Uh, and to insert a risk assessment. So that's actively happening now, just to be able to uh, make the right decisions in terms of certain colleagues on, on their return to work. Yeah, I don't think I can add much more to that. I think you know, we've, we've got established processes or should have established processes for um, sort of new and expectant mothers, for example, you know, vulnerable persons normally doing risk assessments for those people. So we're, we're trying to use that process as I'm sure you know, Neil and Roger are and, and adapt it and make it broader to, to, to capture these people. I think there is a challenge for, for, for us retailers. We've got people who are 69 and it says 70th birthday tomorrow and they've been working and all of a sudden should they then not work and, 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 and a lot of our colleagues want to continue to work and, and they don't want to be at home and, and, and to get yeah, working with them to get them back safely is um, a challenge but an important one. Yeah. Okay. Um, one of the other questions that kept coming up that you told us was was about PPE, deciding what PPE was relevant, who should have it, when they should have it. Um, Tom, can you talk to us about PPE and what you've done? <laughs> yeah, um, deciding what's appropriate. Yeah, and and yeah, people become instantly become very kind of health and safety when it comes to this and about definitions of of PPE or. Just equipment or extra bits of uniform rather than PPE. Um, people will be quite conscious of the government um, defined terminology about face masks and um, face coverings as an example of that. Um, I guess the yeah, true health and safety person in me, um, any output like that needs to be the result of a risk assessment process and that should define what you need. Um, but again also considering this point I made earlier about making people feel safe, 
demonstrating that we're taking action. Um, so an example that we did relatively early, um, we'll be releasing face shields. Um, so these are sort of plastic um, face shields with a headband. We don't recognize them as PPE, um, and we explicitly state that in the documentation that accompanies it, that tells colleagues how to use it, how to wear it, how to store it. Um, but it's available, it's there. If you want to use it and it will give you some added um, assurance, then, then, then please feel free to do so. Um, we haven't found many colleagues to use it, and that's fine. Um, but we've had positive feedback that, that we've tried and we gave them the choice. Um, so that was quite positive for us. Um, face coverings, um, you know, cloth, I'll say it, masks, um, is going to be an interesting one to watch, particularly now that other business businesses are opening up today. Um, it's obviously become mandatory in hospitals and on public transport as well. So it will be interesting to watch the general public and the culture around face coverings and how that might evolve and shift. Um, and then that might then drive changes um, in our industry. Um, and obviously there are regional changes already. So I know that in central London, you know, face coverings are a lot more prevalent than they are you know, down here in Winchester where I am. Um, so that's one to watch. Uh, as an example for us on face coverings, um, we following the guidance as the government was suggesting in an enclosed space where social distancing um, is difficult. We have supplied all of our colleagues with two reusable face coverings per person. Um, empowered them to make their own choice um, and if they wish to make their own purchase as well so they can buy their own face covering or they can make their own as long as it fits within certain guidance that we provided um, they can do that and we wanted to to empower them to to do that and we felt they may be more inclined to wear a face covering if they could design it and make it or buy their own um, than us just just sort of force one on them so for us we're sticking with government guidance it's 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 advisory at the moment but it's not mandatory um, but it will be interesting to see what other people do on that. Um, there's any other things. Um, gloves was a very emotive issue at the, at, the, at the outset, but that seems to have gone a bit quieter now. Um, it's been difficult to supply a sustained provision of gloves, um, but our risk assessment has determined that we um, only really require these gloves for certain cleaning tasks, um, and we're not recommending they're worn at all times, so that helps. But I think as a, as a, as a food retailer, particularly, um, hygiene's always important for us. Um, so we've got pretty good hygiene practices in place. We've double checked our uniform provision just to make sure that colleagues have sufficient uniform that they can you know, come with, 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 with clean kit every day. Um, and I guess the last thing I'd say is, you know, with, with any sort of equipment or process you're adding in, just make sure that you're providing the advice, the information, the instruction about how you put it on, take it off, how you store it, um, and those sorts of things. Just leading on from Tom, I think it, it is the most emotive subject um, throughout this, obviously the whole pandemic to date, and it will probably will continue to be. Um, I think it's difficult from us from, from a health and safety point of view, because it's it goes against everything we worked to in the past from where PPE comes into play and being mandatory, et cetera. So it is a difficult one. Um, but I think just um, reinforcing Tom's point there about if if anyone is going to provide any sort of equipment, um, mandatory, non-mandatory, or whatever, you need to make sure we support that. You support that with um, the appropriate guidelines, advice in terms of um, changing the equipment, um, cleaning as well, um, cleaning the equipment if if it can be done, um, because in a lot of cases in this particular situation, it could make could make things worse. Um, people could become complacent if they got a piece of plastic over their face. Um, People don't change their gloves very regularly or they use the same pair for the whole day and then lay it on the work surface in the staff room. So it's all those things you need to think about if any equipment is going to be, um, you are going to go in that route. Okay. And then from a, from a central point of view, we sort of took a step back uh, in terms of we did a PPE hierarchy. Uh, so we sort of tried to set the PPE in the context of the whole of the society. And we did sort of high, medium and low. So the, the sort of the high uh, areas was, uh, well, the high risk areas was uh, embalming, um, the emergency ambulances uh, work within the, the coffin factory where that was a legal requirement. Um, and it, it supported the idea in retail for face coverings um, and the, the logic that it wasn't proper PP, you know, PPE from a health and safety point of view. Uh, but the uh, but the face coverings were were more appropriate, maybe more comfortable, um, and a decision was taken for uh, us to provide four face coverings for each colleague. So we're actively looking to secure face coverings, 
and it's amazing what is it what's uh, supposedly a face covering it's all sorts of shapes and sizes and it's a bit weird as well you know as in it's just literally a piece of cloth with with a, a few holes in it so that's one another option is more of a mask that you think oh that's that's a bit more comfortable so we're actively going to market now to actually see what what is available uh, so this as both the guys said this is this has been a difficult subject to to find a way to find a common sense way but uh, the 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 government guidance was was you know helped us to achieve that um, and uh, on a, on a practical basis so uh, that's what we've uh, striven, to, like striven um, to achieve sounds like it's still ongoing then from, from what you're saying Roger Yes, well, I think we're just moving towards this fake face coverings. And so we're just uh, trying to source appropriate face coverings at the moment. And the, the quality of the coverings is variable at the moment. So that's what we're, we're trying to look for. Thank you. Can I ask you about risk assessments? What risk assessments you've done, what risk assessments you have in place already, and whether you've adapted those to uh, address the COVID-19 issues, um, whether you've publicised the results of any risk assessments. Um, Roger? Okay, okay. so uh, we've used the, um, the government's shops guidance as our structure, and then we've applied the five steps to risk assessment template. Um, and we've used this on the basis of uh, the issue, whether it's the groups uh, affected, uh, the initial risk assessment, the controls, and that would be various uh, PPE or, or various guides. And then we do a, a residual risk. Uh, and this is done at a strategic level. So one for retail, one for funeral, one for manufacturing, and then one for offices. Um, so that's at, at a strategic level. And these were about 14 to sort of 16 pages, so quite involved. Uh, and then we've done a summary risk assessment for a sign off at a store, uh, store managers um, level. So they've signed off that they have implemented the various guides at a local, at a local level, be that in retail, in funeral, across the 400 You've premises. published those results for employees to see. Uh, we're looking at that in terms of publishing the results. Uh, we look, we're looking to publish the, the sign-off notices, but we will, yes, we will include those within, uh, we, won't, we will make those available to employees uh, at a local level. I'm not sure because there was talk about uh, publishing them at, uh, at the website. Uh, yeah, I think we're, you're saying if you employed a certain number of employees, then you're obliged yeah. to publish them, but yeah. So we're just working on that at the moment. We're sort of going, we're going through the process. It's quite involved and uh, we're just sort of working with the various sectors to uh, to achieve this. Thank you. Neil, Tom, anything to add? Um, just from my point of view, it's, it's sort of a, a weird approach to risk assessment in that the, the, the government started driving the risk assessment concept quite late on if in the scheme of things um, after the guidelines had, uh, or others, after a lot of us already got these, uh, these things in place. And it's, um, so we've we've taken quite a stripped back um, approach to the risk assessments in terms of how, how we how we do that. So we've got stripped back format, and it is about collating what we've done done to date. Um, and the difficult thing is, if you apply the obviously the the risk rating side of things for anything like that, then identifying what the real risk is from COVID nineteen is quite a difficult question. So. Do you have to do that per geographical area of the, I say, or the, the number of cases in that town or, or, or whatever it might be? So we have done quite a stripped back version of a risk assessment and used it to collate all those controls that we've got in place. Um, and in terms of publicised the results, um, we, we have always publicised um, some aspect of our COVID-19 controls on our website. Um, and we, we intend on maintaining that stance um, and that's how we're going to publicise the results of our risk assessments just by highlighting some of those core controls um, and we're now in the process of reviewing the content on there to um, make sure it's current because obviously it initially went on there a, a few weeks ago. Yeah, not much, not much to add really. We followed the using the government guidance, um, overlaying that with the risk assessment format. Um, with regards to communication, our policies, processes, posters, um, all detail the outputs of the risk assessment itself. And we've also sent emails to our members um, for information on our website, similar to, to, to Neil. Um, I guess the only thing I'd flag that, that we've not mentioned is the, is the poster that the government are asking us 
to put up in our locations, our, our, our workplaces, that explicitly says we've you know, undertaken a... That's a, a download, isn't it, Tom? I think on one of the government websites, I've seen that you can download. Yeah, yeah. so you can get it from the same place you get the, the, the working safety guidance that we've referred to. Um, and yeah, they're requesting that, that people put those up in their workplaces. Well, we've got a couple more questions, but I think what the, the, I'm conscious of the time, so I think the best thing to do now is for me to hand back to Irina so that we can do um, a question and answer session and allow uh, anyone attending to put any questions to the panel they wish to. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much for that. Yeah, we do have a couple more polls as well, but I think we'll come to that at the end if we've got time. Um, some interesting questions that are coming through, and I think also what's been interesting is that face coverings, obviously masks, um, interest, interesting conversation with that. Um, and the culture of that, thought that was key coming up, and also that PPE can in itself be risky. Um, so I thought that was quite interesting too. Um, in terms of questions, so I'll just ask these, and perhaps the best person, Gary, you might know the best person to, to ask these. So how have you had to change your monitoring of stalls um, from a central perspective in your own personal roles? Um, to ensure that COVID-19 controls are being implemented in those stores, um, given that many support teams or auditors may be working from home? Uh, either of any, any, any you can pick that, I suppose, for changing monitoring and stuff, so... So, so at okay. Central, sorry, at Central England, we've got um, a compliance team. Uh, the compliance team went from a sort of formal audit visit and an audit process to uh, briefer support visits. So it wasn't scored, it was uh, turning up uh, one store per day. Uh, they were often the only people that the, the colleagues saw for weeks, literally for weeks. Um, and then about a month ago, we took the decision to uh, pull that uh, uh, because we, we needed some support to uh, fulfill the, the risk assessments and, and other activities. But whilst we were doing it, I think it was very well uh, uh, supported and, and uh, um, it would, they were, the actual colleagues were uh, like the idea of seeing someone from outside really in terms of the visit and that, that gave us comfort and uh, assurance that certain basics were being applied in terms of the social distancing and the, the, the PPE and, and other controls. So it was a sort of basic version of, a, of, a, of an audit, it was a support visit and then that it was um, reported back and then we collated the results and communicated that to, to retail. Okay, could you have maybe one other, if you've got anything else to add and then I'll go on to the next question. Do you want me to go, Tom, or? Um, just, I mean, initially we, um, we suspended all our monitoring in terms of um, our um, compliance inspections, our health and safety audits um, and our test purchasing program. Um, we then a few weeks kick-started a light touch version of those. Um, so we, we started with a, similar to Roger, a social distancing support visit where the audit team would be visiting one store a day, um, undertaking a very light touch inspection. And it was not to, again to score the stores or anything like that. It was just to check if they had everything in place or they needed any support in, in maintaining social distancing. Um, but at the same time, we started to drip feed some of the key compliance issues in there. So there's a bit of fire safety, a bit of food safety, but very light touch to start with. And then the intention is to gradually um, ramp that up uh, until eventually we will be back to the to, to the uh, what we call the, the new norm to an extent. Um, our area managers are, are back in stores as well. So they do um, have an inspection uh, inspection visit form as well. So we've we've tailored their their forms to include social distancing as well. But they're they're now sort of ramping that up as well. Um, and we've put some controls into place about how they conduct themselves when they're in stores and hygiene measures, etc. Okay. All right, uh, Tom. Maybe you want to answer the next question and perhaps add anything else that you wanted to on that. So this one's interesting. How are the safe store capacities calculated? And can you imagine this is based on square footage, but are there any other fact, or they can imagine, sorry, the questioner can imagine this is based on square footage, but are there any other factors you would recommend taking into account if trying to determine the customer count for a small independent shop? Yeah, it's a challenge. Um, and I don't think there is a magic formula to work it out. I mean, the logical way is to go for um, two meters you know, squared per person on your shop floor, taking out your fittings and everything, and then working from there. Uh, when we did that, though, we found that the number was just too big. So um, 
I can't recall exactly what we did with it, but I've got, we, we at least halved it, if not more, um, because that felt right. Yeah, we, we know a lot of the stores in our estate, we can take a, a, a judgment on that. And we did want to apply some, some consistency for it. So, so we applied that model across our estate, having since checked it with some of the area managers. Um, and then we issued the guidance and, and said, this is what we recommend for your store. So it might be 10, 15, 20 people in your store. But, and we had to reinforce this, um, as the store operational team, you guys know your stores better than we do and you can see the customer flows and you can see how people are acting. So if we've suggested 10 and you think it's eight, seven, then, then eight, seven, you know, you, what, what, what you think is right, this is only a guide for you, to, for you to use. So that's the model that we've gone down. And this traffic light system that we're trialing at the moment, um, we can punch in those predetermined numbers into that. So that traffic light system will help us to manage those numbers. Um, but, it, but, but, but it's difficult. Um, and you're reliant on human behavior and people to apply social distancing when they're in your stores, which is not so easy. The government guidance suggests um, social distance champions in store, mm -hmm. which, um, which, which again is a challenge in our smaller estates. And also from a conflict perspective, you know, there's stats out there that suggest there's been a 25% increase in violence and aggression um, throughout this because public consciousness, people are a bit more um, you know, fearful. We don't want to put our colleagues at any greater risk of, of, of those um, really prevalent issues anyway so it's a challenge and uh, in terms of social distancing champions that's that's from the staff perspective or uh, do you encourage the customers to to do that as well so this is so this is the government guidance is they're suggesting that again sometimes i think we find in our world that convenience stores and supermarkets the guidance is sometimes the same the application of that guidance is very different so it's not something that we're actively promoting we're not giving anybody a sash and telling them they're a social distancing champion um, everyone in the country is a social distancing champion as far as i'm concerned we all know two meters um, we all know that's what it currently is uh, and and people should be following that so we're empowering people by putting the floor markings down the posters up reminding them that way mm. anyone and uh, roger neil did you want to one of you add anything more to that roger maybe uh, no no i think i think that was a good summary of things. Okay. Um, other interesting, very specific question about um, have you got any advice or thoughts on the use of air conditioning units? Um, any thoughts on that? Yes, yeah, so um, it, go ahead. Uh, um, just just... That he, added, he added one more thing, um, or the question I did. My view is that as long as aircon and fans are not recirculating air, that they should be okay. Yeah, very helpfully, um, very helpfully it is covered in the government guidelines and it is very much you should consult your um, uh, air conditioning contractor or maintenance company, whoever it might be. Um, I haven't directly been involved in this one from our point of view. Our building services department are looking at it and they're doing a, a review on all our aircon sites to say, OK, um, which ones are recycling, which ones um, uh, attached to various different units. So is it we've got some units that might... Um, uh, service a number of sh shops in a parade for example so they're very much identifying those that um that are of a higher risk and and addressing those and getting the contractors in to do the do the review but at the moment i, I don't know the output of that okay. anybody else want something to add i think just back up what neil said you know we're consulting with our um, technical experts on this um across our retail estate because the nature of the air handling units um we're not too concerned with that in the head office uh, we share a head office space with a number of other businesses there's thousands of people that work there um, and i know that there's been a lot of changes there about the way that the you know the air is drawn it's not recirculated it's all fresh air um, and the, yeah, the, the 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 cycle of the air turnover has been increased okay thank you um where so this is more about one-way systems and way that where they are not feasible is there anything that can be done to offset this while still keeping staff and customers safe it doesn't say how they're not feasible but mm -hmm. um i guess they do want a, an explanation if there is anything that can, you can still keep your staff and customers safe where you can't implement a one-way system I think the biggest thing we did from our point of view um and we did it probably later than a lot of retailers was the limiting customer numbers so if you um can't um like i say in a lot of our sites we we imagine not to implement the one-way system because we're finding the aisles are so narrow 
you'd get someone stop in the first aisle and all of a sudden you've got a backlog of customers leading in that first aisle or them squeeze past people and it's been very difficult and also the, the nature of the aisles are not a standard box shape um, up and down scenario so um, the biggest impact we had was limiting customer numbers so if you can't implement a one-way system then you could consider right we need to be stricter with our customer numbers um, the other other measures you could include that we we've done in some sites but not others is the floor two meter floor markings throughout the store so so it's a it's a guide on how far customers should stay apart um, but yeah it's just using a combination that fit that um, fit that scenario but what you don't want to do is make things worse by implementing a measure that's going to make things a whole lot better I think the only thing I'd add, um, and I made reference to it earlier, is um, to protect colleagues closing aisles down when you're working an aisle, mm. um, because that's something that we can control. Um, customer to customer interactions, maintaining that two meters distancing is more difficult, but we can protect our colleagues by um, providing them with that safe space. Uh, Tom, just just so if you if you are restocking in one of your smaller convenience stores in a particular aisle, like to do you close the aisle down? Yeah, we empower the, the colleagues to do that. Absolutely. When it first when it first started, um, we were closing a lot of stores to work stock. Um, yeah, sort of failing to a safe position. Colle a lot of colleagues um, find that actually that pushes a lot of our customers to to the time which we reopen. Everybody thinks that we're going to be full of stock and, and and eggs and flour are back available now, so they'll start queuing up. So it pushes a problem to later. Um, so closing the store wasn't necessarily the right thing to do for all of our stores. But actually giving the store managers ownership of this, allowing them to close the whole store if they feel they need to, or close individual aisles as and when they need to. Um, and also just working a bit smarter. So, so getting the product ready, back of house, onto a trolley, ready to go, wheel it out, close the aisle, work the stock quickly, back out again, open the aisle. Um, as they seem to work for us. It's difficult. Um, and this is why I think the government are facing into it with face coverings in, in enclosed spaces where two meters is difficult. Your average convenience store is exactly one of those places. So supplementing all of those control measures with also, you know, we're looking to put posters up encouraging members of the public to wear face coverings. Um, something in regards to controlling customers coming in, I think it's an interesting question, is um, are the stores paying a colleague to stand on the door? And is that in addition to their current staffing budgets? Is, is it something that you, um, is discussed with um, you as health and safety experts, um, is it within their budgets or is it expected to be incorporated within um, the current budgets? So is security provided? It's a, basically it's a discussion about the strain on storage and managing the customers, um, but also the budgets as well. Have you got anything to say on those issues? From my point of view, we initially, when we started, we, we introduced the queue marshals in our larger stores and we appointed a security guard to do that for us. Um, we then started to introduce it into the convenience stores and, and but we, um, it was a responsibility on the store staff to actually um, act as a queue marshal. We provide obviously the guidance and the training into how they can do that safely. Um, we didn't provide additional resource for that as a general rule of thumb. However, what we were doing at this time is we were, um, obviously our head office um, functions had very much changed. So we were given a lot of support to stores from our head office. Um, so those that were perhaps there, like our training department who we weren't running courses, et cetera, they supported the stores. And one of the key roles they did a lot of the time was acting as a queue marshal and that side of things. Um, it's a really challenging role. It's not a, particularly in the early days when it was a new concept and, and Tom mentioned the antisocial behaviour um, there that it, it, it was, we did get any, a, a peak, um, a, a step up of a um, number of incidents and that side of things. So it's not a great role, but no, we, we don't provide any additional resource other than, like I say, head of office support where it is available. Mm. I think one of the other things for us that we spoke about with this was um, we'd also tried to take away a lot of the non-essential tasks in store. Mm. So we're conscious that it's a very difficult environment to work in anyway. We're asking colleagues to do things like manage an external queue. Um, what can we take away? Um, what do they not need to do so that they can prioritise? You know, risk-based approach, what can they prioritise in external queuing? You know, certainly been one of those things. Yeah, really interesting. So, so my... My understanding in, within Central is that we have provided extra resources uh, for door marshals uh, from 10 to 6 p.m. Uh, and sometimes this could be a, a colleague 
and other times this could be a, a security guard based on risk. Um, sort of we, we found some stores are quite challenging. Um, this is ever ever changing sort of with, with the current issues uh, at the moment um, in terms of uh, the, the, the sort of uh, the, the, the wave of unrest at, uh, currently. So this is constantly being reviewed, you know, in terms of the, the provision of security guards. Uh, so, yeah. Mm. And I think the huge challenge, especially for smaller stores, is they're always going to be looking at their bottom line. And if you can only ever have four or five customers in your store within the space of however many minutes or hours, then you're, you're always looking at how can you even open under those conditions. So it must be a huge challenge um, for all and especially those that are always looking at the, uh, the margin, um, especially on smaller stalls. So we're going to face coverings again. I think it is a key topic. Um, if they don't become man mandatory in the convenience sector, is it possible that you might make them mandatory due to customer perception, which kind of clues into that, that idea of the cultural perception of masks and face coverings, which I think you did touch upon. I think um, the one thing that this whole scenario has taught me is never say never. Um, so I don't know. Um, I, I, if you told me a few months ago that we'd be issuing face coverings at all, then I'd have said no way. So, so, so possibly, um, I think the guidance is, it's my interpretation of the guidance anyway, is written in such a way that we should be encouraging customers that come into our environments to wear face coverings. Um, coming into a convenience store for 10 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, um, the inconvenience of wearing that face covering to you to protect others um, is far less than the inconvenience to our colleagues who are working a manual job in that environment for five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 hours a day. Um, to ask them to wear a face covering for that length of time um, is, is, is quite an imposition to them. They, whilst there are different materials and different fabrics and, and, and types, they're generally not that comfortable. Um, and you also have to look at how you know, go back to PPE, whilst we don't recognise them as PPE, how, um, how these things work together. So if you wear glasses, they often steam up and, and things like that. So I think for me, it's about just actively encouraging members of the public to wear face coverings in line with the guidance when they're in our environments. I think just leading on from that, I think with a lot of these things we've seen, it, it, you find that um, one retailer may, like I say, it's been food retailers up to now, in terms of move on the face coverings, for example, they may take the stance, we're going to make it mandatory. And all of a sudden, the expectation from, from the public and from customers is that much greater that everyone is doing that. So we've seen that in quite a lot of the measures that we've taken. So I think it, as a food retailer, we're, we're all sitting there and waiting and we're expecting something to happen at some point in terms of face coverings. But um, it's going to be who's going who's to move first, I guess. OK, well, we've got just a couple of minutes left and um, I think it would be interesting just to get another poll out if we can, as we've not got any more questions to ask. But if you did feel brave enough, um, those who are still online, please do put up your hand if you want to have a, a chat even, if you want to talk um, while we share this next poll. And the, the next poll is about um, during the COVID-19 period, um, your opening um, times or whether you have actually been open and trading non-stop since then or whether you've been closed since lockdown um, but are now open and trading or will be soon, um, whether you've been closed since lockdown but you're still awaiting new directives to open, um, whether you've been closed since lockdown and unlikely to reopening perhaps um, down to um, dire circumstances or any other um, issues. So it'd be interesting to know how you've been trading during this period. Again, it looks like most of you have been open and trading nonstop to date. And the other half of you, well, 29% are still waiting for directives, which must be hugely frustrating um, for, for you. And then there's, there's one that's put it in other. So if you did want to um, put something in the chat that the person that's clicked other, then, then please let us know. Um, so just sharing those results now with everyone, 57% have been open and trading since um, this period. And those others are still waiting for the directives to reopen. Any comments on that panel before we go on to the next one? 
it seems like a lot of places continue to trade, doesn't it? So. Mm. Okay, we can ask the next question then. Uh, so, let us know your main activities in your organisation, just so we've got an idea of um, where you're from. So, retail, essential goods, retail, non-essential goods, whether you're a distribution centre, a supplier, manufacturer, producer, whether you're in the leisure, sports, pub, hospitality sector, and, and other. So, again, most of you look like you're in the retail for essential goods. So, just sharing those results as well. So that's, that's good to know, um, an interesting profile as well. Um, we are coming to the end of our webinar today. We do have more, um, we're sure that we can talk about, um, and we're certain that the, you probably have more questions as well that you may wish to ask. If you do want to do that, please send them through to membership at uk.coop and we can follow up on those um, with you. Um, we're really grateful to our panel who have done this at, um, in their own free time. So we're, we're so grateful to Tom, Neil and Roger and Gary from Co-ops UK. It's really interesting to hear other views and also cooperative ways of approaching um, this issue. And it doesn't surprise me in the least at the level of attention that is given to this um, in the cooperative sector. And we are always wanting to share that information with all of our uh, colleagues and those that are participating in these webinars. So you will see the recording of this webinar. Um, if you do want to go over some of the things that were discussed um, on our website in the coronavirus um, section of our website, you will find that at uk.coop slash coronavirus. And we'll also be putting up um, the questions and um, any of the links that came up on the chat Again, we'll follow up with uh, an email to you all just to make sure that you've got those details as well. We'd also appreciate your feedback on this um, webinar, so we'll send you a link. If you could just fill out the very quick survey, that will give us a much better idea of how we do this again. Um, and also, we'd be very happy to do it again as well, I'm sure, for, um, for others that are interested in this really, really complex area. So thank you, panel. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom, Neil. Thank you, Roger. Gary. And we hope to see some of you again soon in future. And thank you again. Take care, everyone. Stay thank safe. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye.